Great. Thank you so much. Hi, folks. From 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 St. Charles Community College, SCC, way down in 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 Missouri. Um, welcome to welcome to to Teacher Talk. We're going to have a this one's this one's titled "A Conversation with Faculty at St. Charles Community College," which would be all on the other side of our Zoom meeting here. This Teacher Talk conversation. Um, is happening today on Friday, November 4th, and uh, faculty from the Department of English at St. Charles Community College are speaking with me, Galen Leonhardy at Blackhawk College. Um, St. Charles, uh, uh, Charles is a comprehensive two-year community college offering a wide variety of transfer opportunities, associate degrees, and certificate programs in the arts, business, sciences, and career te technolo technological field. Oh, geez. Um, in this conversation, faculty members from SCC are going to answer some questions relating to uh, four or maybe five topics, um, community building, advanced learning, placement classes, anti-racist pedagogy, and increasing enrollments in low enrollment courses, which might be something that we would be really interested in here at Black Hawk. Um, so, Let's uh, let's start the conversation with with some introductions here at Blackhawk. Um, Professor Hogim isn't here yet, but he is supposed to zoom in or or stop on by later. Um, I'm Galen Leonhardy. <clears throat> uh, Andrew Hogim teaches literature and humanities classes. Our department has eight full time faculty, three or four part time teachers, and seventeen or so dual credit teachers. The department offers creative writing, literature classes, and, co and, uh, and composition courses. We have one teacher who teaches creative writing classes and several faculty mem members who are teaching various liter literature classes. Unfortunately, there are not many literature or creative writing classes available, and those that are available do not always fill. We have a couple of teachers who teach adolescent literature. All members of the department teach the two first year um, excuse me just a second here while I lose my place. Uh, anyway, all of our teachers the, teach the first year classes, uh, and uh, we have some we have some of the ALP um, uh, classes with co-requisites. At our college, the co the students in the co-requisite classes in the ALP classes are also in their own 101 classes, as opposed to the way that Peter Adams had set it up and the way I imagine you, you all may be doing it over there, um, which is uh, the mixture of ALP students with, uh, with, with the traditional 101 students or the ones who placed into it. Um, let's see. This semester, we've been somewhat focused on creating a vision and mission statement that we could uh, put in our course syllabi. And uh, through that process, we've been defining our relationship to anti racist teaching practices. Um, so uh, I'm going to ask Bryony at St. Charles. Go ahead and start the introductions there, if you would, please. And then uh, we'll move on to um, uh, to looking at the questions and the, the top the questions and topic areas that we're gonna that we're gonna discuss, and then we'll take those questions on. And I'll listen to you and try to ask questions that um, that are that are helpful while we're doing that. Go ahead. Bye. First of all, thanks for having us, Galen, in the English department at Blackhawk College. Uh, I'm Bryony Carter. I'm an associate professor of English, and I also chair the Service Learning and Civic Engagement Program at SCC. Um, in terms of classes that I teach, I don't know if that's something you want to know, but I'm happy to um, <clears throat> say that, of course, first and second year composition classes, um, a lot of literature classes um, I like to offer, such as horror fiction, gender issues in literature, and mythology and Western culture are key ones that I teach as well as a course on the archaeology of world mythology in the honors program here. Um, aside from that, service learning, I try to incorporate into most, if not all, of my classes. And uh, that's uh, that's what I do. So thanks again for having us. Jamie? Would you, would you Hi there. I'm Jamie yourself? Novara. I'm also an associate professor of English at St. Charles Community College. Um, I teach composition one, composition two. 
as well as world mythology, which is a literature class that we have uh, excellent, <laughs> excellent fill rates on. Um, I also teach in the honors program, a co-taught course, kind of like Bryony does. Um, I share the responsibilities with a biology professor. And so that course is human science and medicine. So it's really a medical humanities course that we've created for that. Um, Aside from that, I spent many years working with faculty-led pedagogical training, so faculty-led professional development, which I am passionate about and think is, uh, is sort of the way to go whenever it comes to professional development opportunities. Um, I'm excited to talk to you about ALP. I sort of self-imposed the title on myself of, of ALP coordinator um, and have been working specifically with uh, our robust army of adjunct instructors who teach ALP uh, and, and who often come in not understanding what the program is. They've had no, no experience with it so far. I try to work really closely with the adjuncts and provide resources to them so that they're, we're, we're sort of all on the same page um, because that can be really difficult with the turnover. So thank you very much for having us. We're excited to talk about our program. Perfect, thank you so much. Joe, it's a pleasure to see you. I see you have a, a, a green background. Is that a green oh, board? Oh no, that's just my dining room wall. It just so happens to be green. <laughs> it was this way when I bought it. I didn't paint it this way, particularly for, for Zoom, but it was actually quite helpful when I was teaching remotely to be able to put a fun background on. Actually, in my office just around the corner where all of my bookshelves are, my internet does not like to work in there. So when I was teaching entirely remotely, I took a picture of my bookshelves and used it as my background. So it looked like I was in front of the bookshelf. <laughs> it just, just so happens that the previous owners of my home really liked their green walls. I have three of them in my house. Uh, and so it just is conveniently placed right there. Uh, so that's that's that. Maybe, maybe if we get if we get bored, I'll I'll shift the camera over and I'll I'll put a little little picture up in the background or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't have fun little Halloween decorations like Jamie does. Um, I just realized that I left up uh, uh, one of my kids' <laughs> Halloween decorations. I'm going to take that down. That doesn't look very professional. Does I mean, it's okay. Uh, it's Friday. Um, so I'm Joe Bauman. I am an assistant professor uh, of English in at St. Charles Community College. Um, I'm also the department chair, uh, for better or worse. Um, I primarily teach creative writing classes um, and I'm happy to, I know there's going to be some questions and some interest in, in what we have done to build a pretty pretty robust program in creative writing along with our literature classes. So I will be happy to speak to that. Um, and then just some other sort of chair kind of stuff related to our our composition program, placement, whatever kinds of things people want to ask about. Uh, so yeah, that's what I do. I, I, I know that, that we'll be we'll be excited to hear about all of that stuff. Uh, Hopefully, it's useful answer. information. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> well, you know, in in, in 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 my conversations with Bry, um, you know, it sounds like it's really quite a, quite interesting and and and, and effective. Um, so, uh, I, I look I look forward to moving in that direction. I'm I'm I was really interested in uh, to start off with what 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 Bryony was talking about, or Professor Carter, I should say, was talking about. Um, uh, you know, in terms of, of how you uh, your your group has been able to, to build community and collegiality, which I think is uh, a, a, an extraordinarily powerful thing to be able to do um, to get uh, to get a group of faculty members um, communicating and and and, and collaborating. Um, I think is is something that doesn't happen every place. Um, so with that, would you all please take a little bit of time to describe the things your department does to build community and, and also that, that collegiality that you were talking about? I, I can start if you like, uh, or Jamie, do you want to, I know you're I was, I was gonna a little phlegmy, so when you're feeling good, you should answer questions when you're, when I was you're, talking when you're about the. I was going to talk about the soup cook-off. I know it's dumb. Yeah, but... no, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a really good example of something we did recently that Jamie kind of has spearheaded for the last couple of years, so why don't you... Share yeah, with us. So last year, uh, it was an HLC visit, and everybody was on pens and needles. HLC is coming. Oh my God, the, the sky is falling. Uh, so we decided to kind of put together like a, hey, let's feed each other and do a do a little like chili cook off. And so we put it together last year. We had several entries. It was great. And then this year, we did it just this week. Um, and so it's a soup, stew, and chili cook off just for our hallway which is probably, uh, so it's the English faculty and adjuncts, the communications faculty and adjuncts, and the foreign languages and adjuncts, and, and reading, reading as well. And so, philosophy, and philosophy know, maybe, now. And philosophy, that's right. 
maybe, I don't know, maybe 50 people were invited to participate and we got 10 teams out of it. We got 10 entries out of it. And it seems sort of silly, but there, uh, as, as Jacqueline, our department chair would say, um, there were, there were people who hadn't talked to each other in like 10 years, there were warm bowls of soup. And, uh, <laughs> And it was it was nice. It was we all just kind of gathered and ate for three hours and voted for each other's uh, anonymous chili soup and stew recipes. And um, you know, it, it, it's a way to help each other get through a particularly tough time in the semester. It's sort of the post Halloween, uh, post Halloween pre Thanksgiving panic that I think sets in. Of there's so much left to do in the semester. So. Um, I don't know. I thought encouraging each other to to talk and communicate and and talk about something other than than school. Talk about food, right? Talk about was actually sort of a um, an unintentional uh, collegiality builder. Well, and I don't know if I would say it's unintentional. I'd say that that's a, a component of why we do those sorts of things. I was thinking about this question um, yesterday and today and this morning. And this is not a really helpful part of an answer because it's not really something that individual faculty members or really anyone has much control over. But the architecture of our building actually has, I think, been very helpful in this. So I meant to make a little drawing of this and then forgot. But our hallway, as Jamie described it, is so in the humanities building on our campus, when you go up to our second floor and you walk down the hallway, the first door on the right side of our hallway is the entryway to our suite of offices, which is its own long hallway all by itself. So we've got the hallway that's got the classrooms in it. And then this sort of, I don't want to call it a private hallway because the door's always open. Anybody can come in, but has all of our offices. And so we are all concentrated in the same area. Um, and I know that's not the case at every school. When I was in graduate school, the, the faculty were kind of spread out really far around this the building of the English department. Um, and I think just that proximity has helped us as well because it, you know, my office is two doors down from Jamie's and then two more doors down from Briney's, and we're not out in a big public area. So I'll I'll like pop my head out of my office and yell something to Jamie and she'll come down and yell back at me or whatever. Uh, and and you know, you, you can't necessarily control the the building structure that you live in so to speak but i think when you're in a that has helped us in terms of 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 building that community the other thing that we've done as a department and i give credit to the former department chair who who did this first um our our meetings our monthly department meetings are really more like a sort of a festive gathering of sorts we have a cart full of snacks and tea and all this sort of stuff and so we try to and what so and that's the meeting that's us and we have, for a number of years, we have purposefully invited our ESL department chair, our reading department chair, to join us at those meetings, partially because they're, they're one-person departments, so their department meeting would just be them sitting around by themselves. Um, but we, we try to make our meetings as a department be not just a meeting to talk about business, but it's an opportunity for us to just sort of converse and talk and eat and drink sadly, just drink boring beverages. Um, but I think that has also helped our sense of not just being a group of co-workers. Um, I remember when I first started, I'm the youth in the room. I started a couple years after Jamie and, and Briny. But I remember being struck very quickly by how close everyone in, in the department was, even right when I was hired. Because, you know, I, I was a graduate student before that. And so I maybe didn't see everything there was to see about the faculty in the department where I was a student, but I certainly didn't get the sense that the the faculty were constantly in and out of each other's offices or, or commingling together in groups within someone's office. Um, and very quickly, that was the case uh, in, in the hallway that I was joining. And then even in my second year there, I managed to bring one of my former professors from, from my undergraduate days to campus. And one of the last things he said to me before he left uh, town was he was he was struck by just how close we all seemed to be. Um, and, he, and he said, you know, I get along very well with everybody that I work with, but there's a diff, you know, there's a difference between getting along with everyone and, and seemingly being very good friends with everyone. And I think also the department over a number of years, there was a significant turnover right before I joined the faculty. And I, I think there were some just very good hires that were done thoughtfully about are these people not just 
experts in their fields, but are these people that, you know, even though we're only meeting them briefly as we interview them, do they seem like the kind of people we want to be around? Um, and I think the answer to that has, has largely been yes. Uh, and so, you know, we, we've also managed to foster a situational environment where when we are trying to solve a curricular problem or some sort of department issue that we need to puzzle out, we are very good, I think, at separating. We don't always all agree on what the solution to a problem is, um, but those disagreements never become personal. You know, we might say, oh, I don't know if that will work. What about this? Oh, I don't know. What about this? But we always end up, we always get along after the, you know, the disagreements are not personal, right? And so I, I think we always still like each other after we have those, those sorts of things um, that happen. And we have also sort of, I think, you know, COVID kind of put a dent in some of this, but we've we've made an effort to take our collegiality off campus. You know, we have get togethers. We I still remember the night we went bowling. Um, there were, you know, 20 of us at the bowling alley and uh, we, used, we would have game nights every now and then. And and not everybody could always go. But those when you can get away from the office, the campus environment that, that is sometimes good, sometimes not. I think that has also helped us quite a bit as well. I noticed there's also that, that, there, that there's a, um, I don't want to call it, it's sort of a, a, a joking, uh, you, you have the ability to joke together. We spend a lot of time laughing. Um, and, you know, of course, I think that um, as with many institutions of higher ed, there's a lot of pressure on faculty for various reasons, you know, that has to do with uh, working with, you know, other departments with other staff and administration, et cetera. Sometimes, you know, there can be clashes that happen as we well know. And of course we're just, you know, the last few years have been absolutely exhausting. Um, but I think that we've always prioritized trying to just for lack of a better word and at risk of sounding cheesy, put kind of the joy in being together at the forefront. Um, as Joe was saying, we, um, you know, don't always agree on stuff, but I think that, and we, talked about this openly too, is that we are really, really intent on maintaining and protecting the space that we have, um, you know, and I think that we speak about that openly um, every so often as a reminder that, you know, there's drama everywhere and we may not always feel okay with certain things that are happening at our college or just politically or, or in whatever context, but that we need to make sure that our unit is maintained because um, you know, stronger together and all that, but we always have each other's backs no matter what, and that's really important. Yeah, and then one last thing I, I would like to add is, and, and there, there's a little bit of speculation on my part, I don't remember, I don't remember if Jamie and Bryony were really around yet for, for this, or if this was still around when they, when they joined. Years and years ago, our department really operated on a very strict seniority kind of situation in terms of course assignments and these sorts of things. And I think it was about when when Jacqueline, the previous chair, became department chair, she kind of tried to get rid of that. And so we have adopted a very non-seniority oriented approach to things. So for example, and I and I have a really <coughs> specific example of this. When we create our semester schedule, mm -hmm. and we'll I know you have questions about our, our class distribution, so I won't get into that too much at the moment, but what we do is everyone sends the department chair their teaching preferences for the upcoming semester. And what, what I do as the chair, and, and we're kind of lucky that we actually don't have a ton of overlap in areas of interest. Like there's this, we magically have this weird synergy where we cover everything and there's very little overlap. And so we don't have people butting heads about courses. But so what happens is if we have multiple people interested in teaching a course that we just probably can't get a number of sections for, it ends up, it's a, it becomes a conversation, not a pulling of rank. So for example, a couple of semesters ago, Briny and two other folks all asked to teach the same literature. I think it was like horror literature or something like that. And so I emailed all of them and said, so I don't know if three sections of this will run at one, one time. What, what should we do? And actually they all tried to say, oh, I'll do it later. And I was like, no, 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 no. At least somebody should teach it. And so we, 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 we've sussed out all right, I, I can't remember exactly what it was set out, but it was like, okay, Bryony's going to teach it this semester, but then Rachel will try it the semester after that, and then Christy will try it the semester after that. Or we had we have two faculty members who like to teach poetry writing, and so they agreed to take turns. One would teach it in one semester, one would teach it the other. So it, it, it we really have managed to avoid 
creating an atmosphere where there's this sense of some kind of hierarchy um, in terms of, oh, I've been here the longest, so I get things automatically. Uh, we've, man we've managed to kind of excise that from the department. And I think that has really also contributed, you know, you know, everyone, when it comes to our work as, as and within a department, I think everybody views everybody else as equals in terms of who gets to do what or has to do what. Um, and I think that has really contributed significantly to that, um, that collegiality, because there doesn't feel like someone's been told what to do or anyone's pulled rank on anyone else. So I just wanted to mention that because I think that's really been a significant piece of that too. Like I remember when I first started, I thought, oh, you know, it's going to be years until I get to teach a fun class because I'm the new guy at the bottom of the totem pole. So here we go. And then I was teaching two literature classes my first semester and I was teaching creative writing classes my second semester because that would, you know, the approach was let's, what do you want to teach? Okay, let's put it on there and we'll shuffle people around and we'll give everybody a chance to do what they want to try. And so I think that has really contributed to that significantly as well. I, the first time, um, uh, and John I, I, or Joe, I, I don't, I don't want to exclude you, but I, I'm also curious about this. Um, with with Bryony and Jamie, the first time that I met them was at Tyca, and and they were they were they were collaborating on a presentation. I'm curious about the the, uh, the kinds of academic collaborations that you're doing. Well, the kinds of, of publishing and presentation collaborations that you're doing. What's what does publication look like there? What does going to conferences look like there? How much money do you get for that? that kind of well, we're very lucky to have a, oh, I'm sorry, Jamie, did you want to, okay. We're very lucky to have a very strong um, faculty association. And when it's time for collective bargaining, we are very steadfast in defending our professional development funds because we get a certain amount um, every year and a certain amount of that can roll over to the next year. And so in terms of being able to locate the money to paper conferences we're very very intent on maintaining what we have and so that's important as far as the collegial collaboration um trying to think if there's ever been like a fancy process for this but i think um it's more like hey i want to apply for this conference do you want to do it okay you know it's again a very informal conversation um as far as conference presentations go um and i think that the typo one was very much like that i think sarah Jones was the one who organized it and then asked Jamie and Michael Kelker and myself to present at it. And so again, it's, it's a very organic process in terms of that kind of collaboration. But then of course, there are the more, um, you know, deliberate planned out types of collaboration that we do. So, um, you know, for instance, I think like the weeds pilot, Jamie, would that be a good one to talk about? Do you think as a like a faculty collaboration? I don't want to put you on the spot, but no, that's okay. I'm happy to talk about DC Super Pets on the TV here. One of the things that a, a, a great collaborative strategy is that a few of us, and again, we keep talking about Jacqueline. I wish that she was here because she could speak to keep praising her, but. Uh, she came up with the idea for um, WEEDS, We Encourage and Empower Developmental Students. Uh, and again, it seems like our department, I'm realizing this is for speaking, revolves around food, but it's about feeding our students. Like the project was to literally get foods, food, and fresh food uh, and water into the bellies of our students while they had this block of three hours over lunchtime uh, in classes with the same instructor. And so we, that's, that's one of the things we did. There were three of us that piloted the project. And so we would all keep in close communication with other people who served as our, um, as our, uh, uh, what's the, the, the non-participating, oh my God, the non-participating part of a, a Control of a group, study. I believe. Control, Control group. group, thank you, thank you. The collaboration. I should know this, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we also had two instructors who were sort of in the control group. And so the five of us worked really hard that semester to uh, work together with our anecdotal data and then put together surveys for our students to talk about how well this worked or what wasn't working. Um, and so, yeah, it was about feeding our students and getting them the kinds of resources that we thought that they might need. There's more to be done. Uh, hopefully in the spring, we're revitalizing this project a little bit better, but it was a great opportunity for us to talk about the non-cognitive needs of our students. So are they being fed? Do they have breakfast in the morning? Do they, do they don't have time for lunch because they're in our classes. So how are they being nourished? How are they being able to pay attention in our classes? 
Um, if, if you're hungry, you can't pay attention. I get hangry and my students certainly do too. So uh, that turns into a, a, a wonderful collaborative activity for us. Um, if I might talk about a couple of other conference and publication type things, um, I've been extraordinarily lucky to work with another professor on campus to publish a textbook. So the two of us teach world mythology um, and I was approached by Kendall Hunt, uh, which is a publisher in Iowa. Um, I was approached by them several years ago and they said, hey, do you wanna write a textbook? And I, I was like, this is, this is, but I looked deeper into it. And then uh, I thought, I'm not taking on this project by myself. That's entirely too much. Who's the best person I know for this? My colleague, Christy, who also teaches this and is a wealth of knowledge about folklore and mythology and, and storytelling. So she and I worked for, for years to research and edit and create a textbook that we now use for our students. It's so cool because show up in either of our classes and say things like, oh, Christy told me you were amazing. She said you helped write this book. And we, we I don't know, sort of help each other uh, uh, pr with our students, getting each other's students into each other's classes for the following semesters. Um, opportunities I've had is uh, working with co-writing on, on papers. The biology professor that I mentioned, I teach the honors course with, she and I were accepted um, to, to write a paper that was sort of a, a, a study, sort of a self-study on, on the collaborative humanities as an English course, because the, the, the science humanities course that we teach actually counts for English 102, which I'm sure Bryony and Joe can talk a little bit better about how we cross list things later. Um, but we, you know, we were accepted into a science journal about the pedagogies and how this is kind of a cool idea to start teaching medical humanities to not necessarily science students, but to honor students. And so the collaborative opportunities, they sort of fall in our laps and we jump at them, even, even if it's not necessarily a very formal process for, we don't have um, obligations to publish. Uh, you know, that's not a part of our, our job. We're, we're really focused on teaching, but for those of us who want to take on the extra, the extra work of that or just pursue a passion project, it's been encouraged. Um, and I think that's a, a very cool thing. Bryony and I went to Puerto Rico together <laughs> to, uh, I, we did various kinds of presentations at the National Women's Studies Association, I believe it was ago. So it's sort of a, hey, I'm going to this cool conference. You wanna do, you know, not necessarily even, even even present on the same panel or whatever, but do you want to go with me and find a way to sneak in and listen to Bell Hooks talk? And uh, you know, we we try to share these conference opportunities with each other, especially when it's in a cool place like Puerto Rico. And of course, we went we to the next uh, time you're going to go. Please. Yeah, yeah, well, and like five of us went to Bold, no Denver for a developmental education conference, and then we also all went to Baltimore. And it, but a lot of that, again, the ability to do that is, as Bryony said, we have a a very strong union and a very strong uh, bargaining unit when it comes to. So the college is contractually obligated to fund X number of dollars every year for every full time faculty member, uh, and that has that's what really allows us to do those things uh, in particular. We have the opportunity sometimes if um, someone retires or, you know, the all the funds like has reached their maximum for rollover funds, what's left goes into a pool that we can then apply for. And so if we do want to, you know, pursue another professional development opportunity and we're technically out of our PD funds, we can apply to secure more for that. So, of course, you know, we have all these wonderful collaborative ideas and we find creative ways to do it. But of course, we're also very lucky that we have financial backing to make some of these things happen. And so, yay for faculty association, because uh, we've worked very hard to maintain that. Do you have, do you have anything else that you'd like to say about the, this, this wonderful collegiality? I, I'm going to take the silence there as a no. <laughs> I mean, we could, but I know you have a lot of other questions, so <laughs> it's it's up to you what you'd like us to I'm, talk I'm about. Yeah, I'm, I'm encouraging that we that we move forward in sort of an awkward way because we don't want that to leave. All right. Anyway, um, would you please? I like putting please in the question. Describe your AL your advanced learning placement courses, uh, the ALP courses, how they're set up, 
Um, we have, like, as I said before, we have, we have only basic writers in our ALP English 101 and then the prerequisite classes, for example. Um, how, are, how are your, A, uh, I'm interested in how your ALP courses are taught. Um, you know, the English 101 and the co-requisite individually as well as together. Your experiences with Peter Adams, your success rates and the kind of assessment studies associated with those classes. I know that's a mouthful, but uh, I, can, I, I think I'm just going to let it be there. Jamie, do you want to yeah, start can, as our lovely ALP coordinator I'll and Brian start, can fill in any I'll gaps? I'll start with the basics. Uh, Joe can pick up with success rates. <laughs> I'll try. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, so ours are English 101 and then English 096 is the developmental writing section. So when I say 101 and 096, that's what I mean. Uh, so our English 101 course, the students that are solely enrolled in English 101 total seven. Um, the students who are co-enrolled in both that English 101 class and then also in the 096 class total 12. So when we are teaching 101 that day, we are teaching 19 students, and then 12 of them follow us to a separate uh, a, a separate classroom. And I actually think the separate classroom helps to delineate the difference from that. So that's a just sort of a, a sidestep. But so those 12 students that come with us to 096, we don't have, uh, in fact, I don't have a separate syllabus for them. Um, because the way that we look at it is that that course, that developmental writing course, is to support the work of 101. And so the assignments are the same. They don't have three separate essays that they're writing. So it doesn't, and this is one of the things I try to explain to the semester, uh, taking two English classes. You're not taking whole curriculums here. The 096 class is only in the support of 101. Um, one of the things that some of us have done to encourage uh so we've we've used the hub we are using this textbook which we think is quite quite good um it perhaps gets a tiny bit repetitive whenever you've taught it semester after semester after semester but one of us who traveled to denver to talk about during the cade conference um was using themes for these classes so picking a, a theme that can kind of transfer one of the things i do is music so we talk about music and culture. And so my 101 students are writing essays about music. When they show up to my 096 class, they're working on the pieces of those essays. Um, so it works either way, whether you're doing a standard textbook, if you're using the hub, if you're using a theme, whatever. Um, some people choose actual pieces of literature. Shh, just a second, buddy. So we, um, all right, Joe, I need. Sorry, yes, I, I was looking at, we have a, fa a fact book, data book that uh, has some of our success rate information. Um, so I was kind of distracted. I hope I pick up approximately where Jamie was, where, where Jamie left off. But so, right, so I think she was talking about text, the textbooks and, and such that we use, right? And is that correct? So we adopted a couple years ago, and just yell at me if I'm repeating too much. We adopted Peter Adams's text, The Hub, um, that a couple of people Jamie, you may need to, once you are able to correct me on this if I'm wrong, a few people a few years ago, pre-COVID, maybe into COVID a little bit, now I think all pre-COVID, um, piloted his text in pieces of it and helped kind of give feedback on what the final version was going to be. And he actually came to our campus uh, near the end of the development process to sort of talk to us about that text. And what was particularly one of the so particularly unique things about that text is that it is a direct digital access text. Did you already talk about this, Jamie? The DDA part? Okay. So yeah. it's a direct digital access text, which means that so students, when they register as part of their tuition, pay for access to the textbook. And then it is a digital text that is immediately available to them uh, on the first day of class through our LMS, which is Canvas. There is some backdoor setup stuff that our, the faculty members have to do. And, and one of the sort of humps that we've had to try to get over has been when we get new faculty members in, both full-time and part-time, full-time people who are teaching with that text for the first time. It does have a bit of a learning curve to getting started, and sometimes there are some tech issues. We had some weird problems this semester uh, that we hadn't really had before. Um, but overall, the, the benefit has been students don't have to go buy the book. Uh, their financial aid has already covered the cost of that book. And so there's not these barriers at the beginning. You know, you don't have people coming in saying, oh, my textbook's not going to get here for 
two or three weeks. I'm waiting for financial aid to, to green light me to go buy it, blah, 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 blah. The, if there is a downside to it, it is that kind of user f- figuring out the configuration of the book sort of on the back end on the tech side. Uh, but we found that it, it has been a good text to use, especially for those developmental writing students who probably something that 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 other folks will find familiar is they have a lot of oftentimes have what we call those non-cognitive issues. So it's not an inability to do the work, but these other things outside that are impeding their ability to to engage and and be as successful as possible. And sometimes there are financial issues related to textbooks. And so we found that the fact that it can integrate right in right that first day has really been helpful. Uh, We don't require our full-time faculty to use that book. They can choose other texts. Like I think Jamie was talking about this, that people use other texts. Um, But in in the out structure, to get back to that part, there's no required separate textbooks in the developmental course. Those textbooks are the texts from the English 101 class. I will say some people do have a separate syllabus. We were very open-ended for how people teach the courses. And that's true for 101, for the combined 101 and developmental course for English 102. We try to give full-time and part-time faculty a lot of freedom. Um, So people will take different tacks with the relationship between the 101 and the 096. Some people do have a syllabus for it. I do know there's at least one or two people who do actually have separate major writing assignments in the developmental part. so, so, but, but we let people do that however we want. We sort of encourage people to take the, it's kind of a workshop sort of approach. And the other thing I would add to that is with the 096 portion of the course, every one of those classes, the classroom in which the course is taught is either um, one of our computer labs that already has compute, like desktop computers in the room or contains a laptop cart that has laptops in it so that If instructors want there to be significant amounts of writing being done in class, we have the resources there for the students who don't have their own laptop or ability to bring one from home. And I think that's been a pretty significant piece of the puzzle. For a while, we didn't have, we we were experimenting with, we had some iPads that were kind of a disaster. Um, And then, but then now we have access to those computers. And we found that that's really helpful for letting, for having the course be this kind of workshop tutorial, one-on-one writing sort of instructive situation. Uh, so that piece has been really important, I think, to, to how that has worked. Um, it feels like you're conferencing with those students and they're getting such individual attention in that 096 mm-hmm. section that yeah. it's with the same instructor. I'm not, I, I, am, I don't know if that's how you all do it, but that it's with the same instructor, that it's in a separate classroom, but you're all working toward the goals of 101. Mm-hmm. And like Joe was saying that we we allow so much creativity within these because our philosophy really is if you're meeting the course objectives, get there however you can. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially, we have we, one thing we did change. For, yes. When, when we adopted this core, this structure, the co-requisite structure, we actually changed the objectives of the developmental class because until then, it, they had been two separate classes. So students who placed there took just the developmental by itself. And then if they passed and moved on to 101, we essentially changed the course objectives to the developmental writing class from being all the, you know, there were very specific objectives. We kind of wiped those out and said, the objective of this course is to support success in the English 101 course. And so the faculty members teaching the developmental writing course don't have these particular things they need to make sure they are specifically teaching because the the range of what the students in those classes need in order to do well in the 101 course, I don't know why I imagine the 101 course is up here. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, what, what they can be so different for what they need. So, like Jamie said, we we try to offer a lot of creativity and open endedness, especially in the developmental writing course, because the intention is just to get those students to being equally successful as the seven that are only in 101 um, in that class. And just to explain, if if anyone's wondering why those numbers. Um, just to be completely honest, the only way we could get the administration to sort of um, play ball was to have those numbers. Um, and, and, and and this is this just for the faculty, this is useful to know, both classes are three credit hours, both for the students in terms of credits they're receiving and faculty compensation. But the second, the developmental class is pass fail. So it's not letter grade assigned, um, even, and the 101 is. And so the reason we have both populations of students in both classes is when we were proposing it to the administration, they they weren't going to let us have just 12 people in the 101, 12 people in the 096. We needed to bring that number back up somewhat. Our regular 101 is capped at 25. So this we do, so we have sections that are just your 101 class 
25 students. And then we have sections that are the 19, 12, 7 split. And when we're hiring new adjuncts, we also, those two courses are taught identically. We have a lot of adjuncts, especially who teach, usually they teach one section of standard on its own 101. I don't like the word standard because that implies something's weird about the other one because it's not, but the sort of 25 student 101 and then the 19 student 101, they teach them exactly the same way. So there's no difference in the instruction in those classes. It's in the, I'm trying to remember which one I'm hand, hand, <laughs> hand gesturing at, in the, in the 101 096 one, the only difference is the number of students and then those 12 that follow to the second class. So instructors teach them otherwise like, exactly the same. Let me let me get some clarification. What in the in the own in your 096 class, that's what you call it, right? Um what what are the students doing in there? Like are they are they taking on any additional kinds of, of information or is it strictly for the 101 class? It's strictly for the well, again, so that depends on which instructor you ask, because some of them will be doing other things, but most people that teach it, they look at what the 101 class is doing and that informs what they're doing in the 096 when I, I haven't taught the developmental in a while so but when I did last teach it I often went the first thing I often did when I walked into the second class was okay what do we need to go over again that we just did in the 101 class and so it's kind of like it can be sort of I hate I don't really like the word remedial but that's kind of like it's to to scaffold them up to what they need to do in the 101 but otherwise it doesn't have a, a set here's what you need to learn in this class by virtue of being in this class if that makes sense yeah, that's a, what, again what kind of success rate do you have ah that i can get for you um that's what i was trying to stare at my computer for so over the last several years i have some data going back uh unfortunately the one thing that they don't have carved out in this data for us is separating the students that are in 101 alone versus 101 ALP. I know we have that data somewhere, but it's just not in the particular fact book I have at the moment. But one thing that I, I will point out is, is we have we somehow managed across COVID to see our success rates remain around the same. Actually, in 2020, 2021 versus 2019, 2020, they went up slightly in our English 101. So over the past five years, we hover somewhere between 72 and 78% success rate in, in the 101 class. Um, and the developmental class is pretty pretty similar. Um, in in the year in the academic year 2021, we had a 76 percent pass rate for those students that were in the 096 class. And last year, it was at 72 percent. So we have a I think a pretty solid pass. And that that pass rate, I want to say this the right way. 72 percent of the students pass. That doesn't mean that. 18% fail, it just it means that 18% either withdrew or failed. So the failure rate was actually only uh, 16%. So there were about, you know, a pretty decent number that actually to be 20. Yeah, there were about eight to 10% that were withdrawing. Uh, and so, so only 16% of the students that were in that class failed to pass uh, if they stuck around the whole semester. Uh, so we've had pretty decent success rates. I know the last data point that I looked at that actually separated the two groups, the ones that were just in 101 versus in the developmental, the success rate was actually relatively similar. We, we didn't see a huge significant difference between the two. Um, Pre-COVID, uh, and I think what actually is the has made the biggest difference is the way that we're placing students. We did have a couple years where we were hopping all the way up to 90% uh, success rate in the in the combined class. Um, combined, when I say that, I mean all 101 students were were total passing at about a 90% rate because we were placing them well. Um, that's perhaps a different question. Uh, but so, but I mean, you know, in the 70s is not bad. But I think if you ask anyone in our department, we'd certainly like it to be higher. But we have remained fairly consistently in that 72 to 78% uh, success over the last five years or so. Can you talk to me about about the placement and that that, that, that the ninety percent success rate? Sure. So the only, when the only other yeah. time I've seen that happen is is when I was able to to do eight week classes and mm, and, mm -hmm. and that that shorter period of time um, uh, and and making the classroom the place of study, which is out of that ALP stuff. I'd been working with, uh, with, with right. Peter, um, uh, with Peter Adams. It was about two thousand and eight, I think, when I first met him online uh, through one of the um, uh, one of the one of the listservs, and and so I'd, I'd gotten that idea from him, and, and later on uh, took it and, and just like made the classroom a place of work. 
Um, right. And then the eight week class, which is short. Which is very, that, that's a similar description to what we do for the 096 part where the classroom is oftentimes a place of work. Yeah, that's a good way to describe it. So our old, <laughs> our old placement system was one where every incoming student, unless they already had college credit for one of our composition courses was writing a placement essay. So they would come to campus, they would go to the assessment office, write their essay, essays would get sent over us to in various batches at various times of the week, and we would evaluate them as a department. So, so well, not everybody, but two people would read them individually, and then we had a third person who adjudicated. Scale was like a one to six. If they got a five or a six, they went into our English 101 class. If they got a four or three or four, they went into the ALP program, a one or a two. We have we have one lower developmental class, but very few students are placed, like maybe one section's worth are placed into that course. Um, and we were having, we found that students were ending up where they needed to end up by virtue of, of that placement method. Um, the caveat was we were getting release time to do that. Uh, various amounts, it slowly went down over a number of years until the administration decided based on some wonky data they found uh, that any student with a 3.0 from high school goes into 101. And any student below that goes into the developmental ALP program. But those students that are placed into the developmental ALP program could appeal by writing to the department chair, who would then decide whether they stayed in the developmental program or if they could just take 101 on its own. Um, and that has actually caused two different seemingly contradictory problems. So the, the obvious one is that some students manage to get through high school with over a 3.0, but are not very good at writing because you can pad that GPA with other classes. So we were having students that were in 101 on its own that really needed to be in the co-requisite course. That I would say was where the biggest problem that, that our success rate started taking a hit when we shifted to that. The, the other problem that is not as much a problem but does cause its own problems is students who have under a 3.0 who are actually probably don't need the developmental program and just need to be in 101. Now we do catch some of them when they appeal, when they would write to the chair Jack, when it was Jacqueline or to me, and I would say, okay, yeah, yeah, you clearly you don't, you should be in English 101. But the problem that that caused for the students that didn't appeal is sometimes there would be this sort of, I guess I would call it like malaise about them, like why am I in this developmental class that not only made them bored in the 096 part, but that could carry over to the 101 part and would hurt, you know, students that didn't need to be getting remediation were being kind of forced into it. And we didn't have a good method of getting them out of that because the problem is by the time you kind of see enough writing to figure that out, they're too far in the semester to just drop the 096 without having their financial aid or their progress get all screwy. Um, and so some and sometimes the fact that they don't think they need to be in the 096 carries over into their work in 101. So students that would otherwise be doing just fine, it affects them in the 101 where it shouldn't be. Um, and so that those are the things that are now not as good placement has kind of cascaded into these these things hurting our success rates. Um, and we have attempted to explain why it's worth it for the administration to pay us to do the the more intensive placement, but that has not gone very far. Yeah, Jamie, I, I, Bryony, do either of you want to add to that? Or is that is that capture pretty pretty well? Okay. I was, I was I was just going to say that you know that that that, that authentic placement is so so is, is really important and um, uh, I think there are ways of of making it um, so that it so that it's so that it is reliable and students are getting close where they need to get placed. I see that Joe's screen has frozen, um, so I, I you know hope that uh, that it unfreezes here pretty soon. Um, since uh, I, I'm going to ask, I'm going to go ahead and move on to the next question then. And I'm going to skip uh, the, I'm going to skip over number three, the anti-racist question and go to the, uh, the, the question about uh, increasing enrollment, because uh, I think that that's going to be something that's really important for us and that's going to help other, other, other viewers find interest right now and then, then move into what I consider to be extremely important um, as soon as I can. Um, so with that, um, uh, based on conversations that I'd had with Professor Carter, uh, I found that the English department, that your English department has developed ways of increasing enrollments in your, in your literature and creative writing classes, which I think would be extremely important to us. 
Um, would you explain what you're doing and, and how that process works and how successful the strategy is? So we use a multitude of strategies to try and increase enrollment. And I don't know if there's any one that's necessarily you know, the formal way that it works out, but there are a couple of different things that we've done. Um, first of all, our English 102 course is, tends to be, again, people can do what they want, but um, tends to be literary based. Um, the other institution where I was an adjunct before I started at SEC full-time, um, their 102 course was complex, focused on complex argument. And so we have the literary side of things as ours. And so that provides a perfect basis upon which we can say to students like, hey, if you enjoyed this 102 class, then, you know, check out our literature offerings. And we have, you know, this variety. We tend to, most of us teach specialized courses in some capacity, whether it's literature or creative writing. So we can usually refer them to one of our own courses or to a colleague's course. And word of mouth like that tends to really um, get you know people in seats as far as that goes. Another thing is that we have um, you know a social media presence um, where you know we have an Instagram and uh, and upload pictures of flyers, put up descriptions about things we're doing and um, that does help as well um, trying to draw attention to that through social media. Uh, we work pretty hard to put together flyers and pass them out in classes. And so there's kind of that you know, on ground kind of word of mouth and you know passing out information about it. Another thing that we found that works really well is cross-listing courses. And so of course, depending on the semester, we don't we don't always have a firm minimum cap for our classes. Uh, it tends to hover somewhere around 10 or 12, but obviously if enrollment is down and there's our strategies to keep classes on, you know, for instance, this semester I think our cap was seven our minimum cap was seven because of whatever trends in enrollment, but generally it's about 10 or 12. Um, and if we find that, for instance, um, like one, when I taught horror fiction last, um, it wasn't clear at about the midpoint in the summer, this was a fall class, whether or not that class is going to meet the minimum capacity. And so we cross-listed it with an English 102 class. And so some students were able to enroll in the horror fiction class if they needed an English 102 credit and like with um, kind of the ALP students and the 101 students, on a, you know, being in the same class together, um, generally there were, you know, same readings, same assignments. It, we just would have to um, augment the course so that it met all objectives or, you know, assign the 102 students an extra assignment that helps them meet the objectives for that 102 class and assign the lit students, you know, a presentation or something like that. So there are ways to increase enrollment in that way. And so that also keeps our literary offerings strong uh, while still catering to students that need that comp. Um, and so that's been one way that we've been able to expand that. We also are just really passionate about the special topics that we teach. You know, uh, Jamie and our colleague Christy and I all teach various versions of mythology. Um, I tend to do kind of the revisionist myth making stuff in my myth and Western culture class and Christy and Jamie teach world mythology every semester. Um, and so we kind of have areas of specialization loosely defined that students come to know is will be on offer um, by one of us. And so that way we're also able, hey, able to keep um, the same students often coming back to our classes. We're talking about, Joe, um, how we increase enrollment. And I talked about cross-listing a little bit and just kind of the grassroots on-ground stuff we do through word of mouth. Um, and so, you know, it's not, our numbers have fluctuated over the years. And I know that sometimes our lit courses can be scrutinized depending on what enrollment is looking like, but we've managed to maintain a really strong offering I mean, there was there were several semesters where we offered over 20 sections of lit within a single semester. And it usually goes no lower than what, 10, would you say, Joe? Yeah, I mean, we usually offer at least 10 every semester. Yeah, the last several years, it's been around 12 or 13. Sorry about that. My my every now and then my my Internet likes to take a quick break on Friday afternoons. And today it decided to take a little longer than usual. We Sorry about that. Days. And it's always when I need to be on something like this, like without fail. You know, it's not just when I'm sitting on my couch that the no, of course lights not. go all orange on it. It's, it's when I'm doing this sort of thing. So my apologies for that. Um, 
and I don't want to. Yeah. So well, I, I was glad you asked about this game because I have a couple of, of things that I, I particularly think about with this. And I, I, I very quickly when we got started, I, I jotted down some numbers for what we're offering this fall and what we'll be offering next spring, which I can share if, if useful. But um, I remember when I when I started at the community college, we, we had a decent number of literature classes. But but for me in particular, I can speak to some of the things we did, especially for creative writing coursework. Um, because when I started at the college in fall of 2014, I remember that semester, we ran one completely full section of intro to creative writing during the day, a, a sort of half full section that was a night class once a week, and then a third section that was an independent study that was like four students I don't know what was going on with that because I hadn't been here. And that was it. Um, and my my understanding was that was kind of how things had been for a long time. And that getting even like a more advanced level course to run was next to impossible. Um, and so I did a little digging uh, on the curricular side of things and discovered that our various creative writing courses only counted as elective hours. They didn't meet a general education humanities requirements. Um, there was no particular creative writing or, or literature focused degree program that students could pursue. So the first thing that we did was we sent our, and I discovered that the other fine arts departments, so art, music, theater, students take their courses and have them count toward a, a, a general ed humanities requirement. And so I thought, well, why, why not creative writing? So long story short, managed to get through our curriculum committee that to have all of those creative writing courses meet those gen ed requirements. And that immediately had an impact on the, the offerings we were able to, to provide in creative writing. We had way more students signing up for those courses than we had before. Um, the state of Missouri, by the way, has done some funky things to our gen ed program that are, I might mention, uh, I, I can if, if useful, but, uh, not exactly directly relevant to this question, uh, but that has played a role too um, in that creative students can take creative writing classes and literature classes and they're guaranteed to transfer to other uh, public schools in the state. And actually some of our private schools are trying to jump in on that uh, equivalency these days, um, which has been interesting. But anyway, once we got those courses to meet gen general education requirements, the, the next thing that we did was we created what our institution calls a certificate of specialization in creative writing. So we it's essentially the equivalent of a minor at a four-year school. So that it, it was a 16 credit program that students could get by taking a variety of creative writing courses and some literature courses. And the reason we did that is we knew we had a population of students that was interested in taking creative writing and literature classes. But with the way that at the time the associate's degree was structured, they could only count one or two of those classes towards a degree and everything else was just electives that, and they couldn't take very many elective credits. So by creating the certificate, those credits, they could take those creative writing classes and have financial aid cover them. Because before that, if a class was not, I think it was if it wasn't covering an actual required area, and if they'd already gotten so many elective credits covered by financial aid, they could no longer use financial aid for courses that weren't achieving something, I think was the term. So we created the certificate program. And then after that, the next big step we took was to actually create an Associate of Fine Arts degree, a full-blown 60 credit program uh, that students can take. And they we, it requires like six or seven creative writing classes. And so by so we started small. So we didn't, you know, out the gate go, let's make an AFA and create a 60 credit program. And we could have. But we we built slowly. And I think we also, and this was a key piece, and I think Bryony kind of hinted at this with the literature courses, is um, we were able to convince our dean at the time, uh, Karen Jones, it helped that she was a former English faculty member, that the way you build a program is you let classes that are small run because word of mouth will start to get out and students will want to take more of them. Um, I think the best example of this is our screenwriting course, which we, so we created the screenwriting course and we were building these programs. And the first couple of times we offered it, four, five, six students signed up, but our dean was like, I'm going to let this run because it, it was only one of one or two really low, small courses we wanted to run so that students could take it. And now the last time that we have, we, we did a hire recent, a couple of years ago who one of the things 
is that his specialties is screenwriting. Uh, it, the last time he taught it, it had 17 people in it. Um, he's offering it again this coming spring. And our registration has only been going on for a week and a half, two weeks. And he's got 11 people signed up for it already. Um, yeah, we have over 75 seats in creative writing courses already filled at this point, And registration has been going on for two weeks. Um, and so really, it, I think it's students will will take those courses when you have something that they can see that it's driving toward. That's the biggest thing, I think, that was the key for us to getting those courses to, to start filling with greater frequency. And, you know, COVID has kind of, they've taken a little bit of a hit during and then since COVID, but we're starting to see the sort of regrowth. But at their peak, when after we had rolled out this Associate of Fine Arts degree, there was, I think it was like fall 2018 or 2019. So only four to five years after we were just kind of skating through with like two, maybe two sections of creative writing. We had five sections of our introduction to creative writing course, and then four advanced level courses that were all full in the fall semester. Um, and so like this fall, we're not quite back to that point yet, but this fall, so this current semester, we have five sections of our introduction to creative writing course running. Uh, three of them are online. So that has not that has not hurt to 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 tap into the online situation for for writing courses and for lit as well. Um, and then we have three of our upper division upper division creative writing courses going this semester um, and thirteen literature classes. And then in the spring we will have four sections of our introduction to creative writing class, four of our advanced level courses, and then fourteen literature courses on the schedule. Now some one or every 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 semester we have maybe one or two that doesn't make. But generally, these courses are are hitting the threshold we need for them to to run. Um, did you talk about cross listing, Bri, with like comp classes? Okay, yeah, did, that's yeah. a strategy that we've employed. Another strategy, a similar strategy, is to cross list creative writing classes with each other or literature classes with each other. So yeah. this is where the Gen Ed program that the the state has created. We have a without getting into the weeds of it too much. There's a general education guaranteed transfer course called introduction to literature. So what we do sometimes, I know Bryony, you've done this and I've done this. If you want to teach like a fun topics course, but you're worried it's not going to make, we cross list them with our introduction to literature course. So students can take introduction to literature or like, I don't know, uh, horror, we'll just say horror fiction again. And so you cross list them. So students that want to get that guaranteed transfer credit course, sign up for the intro to lit course. And students that want to do the horror lit course, sign up for the horror lit course. And it's one class. And you're, the ones that are doing intro to lit are doing horror fiction. Uh, so it's not really extra work for you as the instructor, uh, but you guarantee it often guarantees that those classes will make because you might get six or seven in each part, but then you end up with a class of 12 to 14. So that strategy has worked for us as well. Um, and then we also do the cross listing with the comp that I know Brian talked about that has actually quite helped as well. And our administration has really bought into that when we have proposed, hey, what if we cross list these? Because then kind of the way that we've packaged it for them is they get what they want where more students get into the comp classes they need, but we also still get to teach our literature classes. And often what happens, and this has happened to me a number of times, the students that take the, 10, the English 102 version then come back to take the actual lit version later with different books and different stuff, but you get them returning because they see, ooh, that seems like a fun, this is a fun thing to do. I want to do that again for this other, this other course credit. So those are some of the big strategies that we've employed that have really helped those enrollments. And, and with the creative writing classes or that like the horror lit, and, and, and you could join, you could, you could cross this horror lit and creative writing. Course. Oh, you know, we actually, well, so when I said that, what, what I've actually done, we haven't actually ever tried doing the lit. I had actually thought about cross-listing a lit with the creative writing. Sure. What we do with the creative cool. Yeah, that would be interesting. I have thought about it, but I haven't actually, actually, no, we have done that. So Christy Gantz, one of our, our, our coworker who we've mentioned, she teaches every spring a poetry writing course that is cross-listed with our introduction to poetry literature course. And she has found, she managed to find somewhere a textbook that talks about both. <laughs> and so she has students, so the students in the literature class do stuff like you would do as a literature student. And the students that are taking the class for writing credit, write poetry and, and read it. And we've actually had a, we had a student last year who signed up for both sections. So she did all of the assignments for both parts. And we have someone doing it again this coming spring. So we have done that actually, yeah. Um, and so we could certainly branch that out in some ways. What I was talking about with the cross-listing creative writing courses, what I do every now and then is I cross-list our fiction writing course with, we have a course just called Topics in Creative Writing. Um, and I cross-list it so that students who have already taken the fiction writing course 
but want to get to workshop new work and keep writing more can do it again under the auspices of another course that meets one of our creative writing program degree requirements. Um, and I try to let them know that sometimes I get people that sign, ooh, topics in creative writing, what's that? And they just sign up for it and they don't really know they're getting into a fiction writing class. So you have to deal with that every now and then. Um, but that's been a way that we've gotten that class to run regularly with students that want to take it more than once. And there, there, then you have students who are having fun with writing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The, I will say the one thing that, that when we got the intro class added to our gen ed program is you do have to make some adjustments for who you anticipate being there because you get students, and this is a perfectly fine reason for them to be there, who are like, oh, I need a gen ed and this sounded... Hopefully they say fun and don't say easy, but sometimes they say easy. Um, but you do get you do have to kind of adjust your praxis of teaching it, knowing that you 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 don't just have the students that are like, I've known I wanted to write novels since I was seven. Teach me how to write my novel. You know, you get a, the spectrum of students in that class has changed, but it does mean that we get more students taking those courses, and we certainly get a lot more of them coming back for more because there's more of them taking the intro class. And I think that's the same case for literature. We have a lot of repeat students that take one lit class and then they take another one. So it certainly has helped. Thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move, it, move it forward a little bit here. I know that, that, that what you've just told us could, could you know, very well be something that, that, that many people over here would be uh, extremely interested in. And um, if they, uh, if anybody were to, were to ask, I will refer them to you for further conversation on that. And I'd, I'd yeah, also sure, like, absolutely. I'd, I'd also encourage you to to look at to look at uh, offering something for TYC on 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 all of the things that, that we've been talking about. The teaching English. Sorry, Galen, I didn't catch that. I think sometimes if you move away from the mic on the computer, it fades the. Ah, how about now? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Oh well, I I don't know where the mic is. So. <laughs> but, we can um, hear you there. Great. Okay. So, 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 but what I'm what I'm saying is that is, is that I, I would I would encourage you to to work with Darren Jensen and the readers at, at TYC and, um, and and put some of this out there. Uh, I don't think uh, I don't think I don't think many colleges have everything that you that you're doing. I mean, it's really it's really a complex, um, uh, you know series of interactions that are happening. And, and so there's, 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 some, there's some really nice mojo that's happening at SCC. And I think, uh, I think other, other, other colleges would be quite interested in, in it now, especially with, especially with declining enrollment. Um, you know, uh, with, that, with, that, with that point made and, and, and that encouragement made, um, uh, I do wanna move on to the, to the serious you. topic of, of anti-racism. Um, so, so uh, our department has been working to implement anti-racist pedagogy lately. We really were, we're, we're, we're exploring our relationship to those ideas, I think, is what's happening. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm curious if you would please discuss how anti-racist pedagogy is, is, is being applied at SCC, the kinds of things that you're doing, and, and what you're discovering um, uh, in, in, in that process of implementing that, that whole theor theoretical construct. Well, I can start with with something that we did as a department. Um, when was that? Spring 2021? Does it sound right? Ish? For that or fall 21. Yeah, somewhere around there. We, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I, I set it up in spring when Vicky was on the way out the dean door and didn't care. Right. Anyway, uh, <laughs> having a having a lame duck dean that just is willing to spend money is a really great time to do stuff like this. By the way, so if you catch wind that a dean's on the way out the door, you just ask them for stuff and they'll just give it to you. So. <laughs> just a little tip. Uh, so I, I managed to, in all seriousness, I, I managed to get our dean at the end of the spring semester for the fall to fund our department reading. And actually, I have to give credit to my coworker, Lindsay Brand, for getting this, this text on, on my radar. Um, we read The Anti-Racist Writing Workshop, a great book by a, a writer and professor named Felicia Rose Chavez. The book, she comes at it broadly from the, the, the lens of teaching creative writing, but really a lot of what we chose to read was very much applicable to literature classes and to composition classes as well. Um, you know, if you just have a little bit of 
elasticity in your thinking, you can see how the things she was talking about applying to creative writing course could apply to any classroom experience, really. Um, we didn't, I don't think we, we didn't read it cover to cover, right? We selected a number of chapters because we didn't want to overwhelm our folks with too much reading. So uh, Jamie and I, I think, Jamie, you read the whole, did you read the whole book too? So we, we kind of, a couple people we read tried the whole to, thing. Right. We tried to pick out the chapters that seemed like they would make most sense for the broadest audience. So I don't yeah. teach creative writing at all. Right. And, so and there were a couple the, of chapters that were, to figure that yeah. Out. yeah, there were a couple of chapters that were very much like, here's what you do in your creative writing class to think through this lens. And so we kind of didn't necessarily use those, but we, we picked out chapters. So we did a sort of a chapter a month and kind of turned Another thing we turned our department meetings into was a little book club sort of at times. We invited our, I think her title at the time was chief diversity officer, our chief diversity officer, Martha Campin, to, to join in. And a couple of other folks popped in periodically. Um, and so really just trying to get people to think about sort of what are the underlying assumptions and not, not prejudices necessarily uh, of certain teaching practices and how we might reconsider and rethink those. You know, the, rea the reality, to be honest, is that our institution is very white. Um, we have a we have a growing population, an international population, a growing African-American population, but still primarily white students, I would say. You know, we live in a St. Peter's where our where our school is located really exists because of white flight out of St. Louis um, over the last 40 years, to be frank. Um, but we really thought that it's, you know, the the approach that philosophy that I've always had, and I think both this applies to both Briny and to Jamie and a number of other members of our department, is when you are teaching toward the marginalized populations, you are, by virtue of doing that, teaching toward the majority populations, right? Um, and so we read that book, we read those large parts of that text, and we've brought in other similar short texts at, periodically for people to read and think about. Um, the institution has done some other, some, some things along similar lines. I don't know if either of you want to speak to anything else, but th that was really sort of the most recent big thing that we as a department did. And I don't know if I would necessarily categorize this as specifically anti-racist pedagogy, but maybe is we've adopted a couple of kind of unspoken policies in our department that I think you could put into this category. So things like we don't want students failing classes they don't need to take again. Um, you know, like, for example, we, we had kind of a history of, of people failing students in classes simply because of attendance, even if they were submitting passable work that should be moving them through the writing sequence. Uh, so we kind of adopted a, a sort of, like I said, unspoken policy of students aren't going to fail just because of how frequently they miss class or or, you know, if they're not turning in their work when they miss class, that's different. But just because of attendance, because, you know, certain marginalized groups sometimes have more difficulty getting to class and campus and those sorts of things. So those kinds of unofficial policy things that, that I think are thoughtfully, you could couch them in that sort of pedagogical umbrella, if that makes sense. Brian, Jamie, do you want to do you want to add to, to the, any of that? I know that there are two sabbatical projects going on within our English department that are actually addressing this as well. We have one faculty member who's on sabbatical this semester who's working on putting together sort of a larger repository of these kinds of texts, not just for our department, but for campus wide. And so she's trying to start sort of an anti racist pedagogy uh, college wide book club discussion group, whatever. There's another that's uh, I only know this because I'm on the sabbatical committee, but she applied for sabbatical this semester also from our also from our department. Uh, fingers crossed that she gets it granted, but it's a, a similar kind of thing. She's looking for ways to to put together uh, pedagogical communities that focus on 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 systems of diversity and how we can do DEI within our own classrooms. So those sabbatical projects, I think, uh, again, if if the second one is granted, I think that those will yield really important things for our department and across the campus that are kind of working towards this sort of teaching circle, reading group, you know, just having people think about things that they may not necessarily have, have considered maybe since grad school, right? Reading theoretical texts that many of us don't just read for fun anymore, but they could really help us to ground our pedagogy in some of those ideas. And two other things that come to mind, um, just you mentioned the sabbatical project too, I, um, reminds me that service learning is also a really wonderful way to 
not just get experiential learning as part of uh, course objectives, but also to, you know, dismantle notions about hierarchy and discuss social justice and have the students have, you know, that tangible experience with it. And so I'm thinking of um, our colleague, Rachel McWhorter Rush, who proposed and teaches an African American literature class. And it is a service learning class every single time. And of course, the service project is intricately linked with, sorry, I think you shaking, um, is intricately linked with their discussions about social justice, critical race theory, et cetera. And one of the projects, which I think really helps the students make these connections is um, called Freedom on the Move. And this is a completely virtual uh, service opportunity that's hosted by Cornell University and a handful of other institutions. And what it asks virtual volunteers to do is to transcribe ads that used to appear in papers uh, before emancipation describing slaves who had escaped from, um, you know, where they were enslaved. And so what this project asked students to do is, of course, look at these newspaper articles, transcribe them, and what the project is, you know, doing is trying to subvert what those ads mean. So rather than see them as, uh, you know, evidence of so-called runaway slaves, they're also giving us insight into who these people were. They're allowing us to, you know, put names to faces and descriptions and to paint a picture of who these people were as opposed to you know what they were being written about you know what was being written about and so that way students are able to make those critical connections between the theory they're reading and the books that they're reading to a project that really helps underscore the work that anti-racism can do and so that's been a really successful project and we have a colleague in history grace moser who teaches african-american history and um, you know, I'll ask students to complete that project and also has them volunteer at Greenwood Cemetery, which is the first African American non secretarian cemetery in St. Louis and help preserve um, records as well as clean up and beautify the space. And so service learning has been a really great way for students, for, for instructors to help students make those connections through, and it is an anti-racist pedagogy to an extent, I would say, um, with that, and I'm I'm really focused on um, critical service learning, as they call it in the field. And so, you know, obviously, volunteerism is really important and um, you know necessary. But really, having the students not just critically reflect on their experience, but specifically link it to issues of social justice. Why does this service need to happen in the first place? What is it about um, you know these hierarchies that we can deconstruct and better understand and better destabilize through this work. So um, we're always trying to push in that direction. And I think that that's one thing I would say about our faculty in the English department and, and in other departments on campus is that we are really open to change, um, as in we're really open to changing our approaches to the classroom, to changing our reading lists, to um, you know, conversing with one another and our colleagues and especially our students and taking their experience to, experiences to heart and, and channeling that into how we set up the syllabus. Um, you know, just back to my horror fiction class and I'll, I'll wrap up with this example. Um, I taught it several times and I decided this last go around to teach it through an American studies lens. So looking at horror as a production of culture and also how, you know, that influences, you know, there are all these reciprocal influences there. And, and I decided to specifically include a module that had to do with um, critical race theory and horror as well. And we read some black authors and some authors responses like Victor Lavelle's The Ballad of Black Tom, which is a very specific response to a very unsettling story by H.P. Lovecraft called The Horror at Red Hook. And, again, placing that into conversation with critical race theory and asking the students to interrogate how horror um, is, a, is a jumping off point for an author like Lavelle to you know, offer a critique. So I will stop there because I can keep talking. Jamie, do you have, do you have anything to add at all? Oh, Jamie, do you have it? No, no, okay. <laughs> um, the, the 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 online service learning that's with Cornell University. Where, where, how do you, I can how get do you the link. It's called so Freedom on the Move. Freedom on the Move. Okay, great. Yep. I, I can just look that up. Oh, 
Okay. And we'll do that. Um, let's see. I think we've done all of them but the last one, and I think we have a little bit of time to do this. Um, I, uh, I was, I'm, I'm interested in your experiential and interdisciplinary learning uh, that you're doing at SCC. Um, and the, you know how English faculty are contributing to honors and service learning programming, as well as um, maybe explore some of your co-curricular events like Democracy Days or something like that. Depending on how much time you have, I, I know that the person who's going to talk about some of that isn't here, right? Um, but uh, or maybe maybe not. Maybe maybe. Oh, absolutely, I can start really quickly with service learning, and um, then one of my colleagues here can talk about Democracy Days more specifically. But um, service learning was a program that officially began in 2014 in a pilot stage. And it, it was myself and two staff members who kind of helmed the whole thing. And, um, you know, we were just very focused on getting faculty to offer this project as part of the requirements for a class. Um, and, you know, we, we implemented a day of service and things like that. But as the years have progressed and, you know, turnover happened at the college, et cetera, I was able to secure a little more, um, uh, release time in order to expand the program and really put the emphasis on civic engagement and just kind of, you know, incorporating these aspects of citizenship and social justice into as many courses as possible. And so my definition of what constitutes service is really broad. Uh, volunteerism is wonderful, but it can also be, um, you know, advocacy work in another way. And one way that's really, that has really managed, you know, enrollment can sometimes decline for these sorts of classes, but one thing that's managed to keep it ascending over the years is that we have a service learning, sorry, if you hear yelling, my parrot's obviously into something, um, but um, we have a service learning designation. And so, for instance, if one of our English faculty are teaching a service learning English 101, it'll be designated as English 101-01S. And so that gets recorded in the student's transcript as if uh, with text along the lines of this student took a service learning class and completed substantial community service. And so it's like a permanent record of the fact that they did this work. And so service learning gets offered across the disciplines and so many instructors are encouraged, instructors encouraged to do whatever they want, you know, in terms of advocacy work. And so we've had some really cool experiential projects. And so on top of that, we also, um, the Royal We, um, we also have offered like a semester of service program where students can gain recognition for uh, any kind of advocacy or volunteer work they do. And um, next week is the week of service, which was kind of my idea of adopting day of service during the COVID-19 pandemic. So it's a full week where people can volunteer or do advocacy work in remote, virtual, and in-person capacities. So we there's a lot of opportunities for that experiential aspect of it through service learning. Talk about the honors program just a little, and then yeah. Joe, maybe since you have a class that participates with that. Um, so with the honors program, I've mentioned this several times now, I teach sort of the medical humanities. What's been really, really fascinating about that is getting to team teach with someone from a completely different division, a completely different field, someone who literally thinks about the world differently than I do. Um, so that has been, Bryony has teamed up with uh, one of our anth anthropology, archaeology, anthropology professors, which is cool because it's in the social sciences. Um, but I found it just really fascinating to, to teach with someone in the sciences as an English professor. One of the things that the honors program has, we have the designation on your transcript, so students, you know, get recognition for taking an honors class. Um, but they're learning different different course outcomes. So they are getting credit for English 102. So we're meeting those course objectives. But uh, the upon ourselves to write our own course objectives for the class that we created. Like, what do we want you to get out of this? And so some of our projects, um, we have three main projects. One is on science literacy, which talks about, oh God, which John, don't trip over that, which talks about um, vaccine science and just uh, uh, making sure that people know how vaccines actually work. The second is about um, ethics and medicine. And we talk about the Tuskegee syphilis study and things like that. We have our students write their own Hippocratic oath. Um, so we take them through the history of different oaths that nurses, physicians, psychiatrists, etc., have have given over the years, and we have them write their own. So pick a profession and write your own oath. 
Um, and then the third is about pseudoscience. So they do a whole research project, where they, a topic, is, which God has just gone wild lately. Uh, it's, uh, and then they give a presentation to the class on why it's pseudoscience, what pieces convince people that it's real and, and how that works. So um, it's been an extraordinary learning experience for our students, but also because they show up in our individual classes the next semester. Um, which is which is kind of cool. So it's a recruitment tool as well. Um, another way that the honors program works, any one of our individual classes through an honors contract. Um, and so experiential learning of doing something extra within a class for honors credit. So in my mythology, I had students do uh, deeper dives into specific characters that they're interested in, or um, one student put together a presentation for my future students on you know a, a category of mythological monsters that was they come up with these these really cool projects that relate to the class but goes a little bit above and beyond um, the way that it has worked in the past we don't know where all, but both instructors receive three credit hours of pay and there goes all the legos all right joe talk about democracy days please. yeah yeah i'll, I'll take over well the Lego destruction happens. I actually, I, I just want to say, um, I think the more accurate way to describe the way that the English department is related to honors and service learning and democracy days and all these things is not so much that we are involved in them. It's that they have emerged from our department. Um, you know, Briny created service learning. The fact that we have an honors program came out of the brain of Heather Rogers, another English faculty member. Um, our Democracy Days, which I will talk about in a second, was the brainchild of Michael Kelker, who is now a, a professor emeritus. Um, and so, the, you know, a lot of this stuff, it's not that they exist and we participate in them, it's that they exist because we created them. So I just like to, I like to give our, our department the credit that they deserve. Um, so the Democracy Days is, at least historically, has been a week-long um, series of lectures, panels, presentations, films, guest speeches, et cetera, et cetera, uh, of a variety of subjects that, that come at the concept of democracy from a variety of angles. Um, and, and so Michael Kelker, like I said, he is a faculty emeritus from the English department, has long been the kind of coordinator of this program. Uh, and, uh, oh, we lost Jamie. Um, and, uh, so it's a week long thing and there's three or four panels every day and we we try to be very cross disciplinary in in our creation of that program so for example uh just this past this this past democracy it's always near the end of september we had a panel on banning books that had members of psychology of history and of the english department um we bring in all sorts of speakers uh we've had members of the missouri house of representatives and senate uh join us members of law enforcement. A couple of years ago, we I think this was just before, in 2019, before COVID, we had a panel on like women in leadership in St. Louis. And so we had, I can't remember, I can't remember who the individuals were, but, but there was one woman I remember who was involved in the building of the Interstate 40 expansion several years ago, um, but, but, but all sorts of a variety of, of things related to the concept of democracy. And a number of these panels frequently involve students. Every year, I put together a panel panel called The Pros of Protest, where students from one of my creative writing classes sign up to be a part of this panel. They write whatever they want. Um, I don't read it in advance uh, about using the idea of protest. And then they read their work and then we take questions from the audience. And that's another significant feature is the program is they're always interactive. There is a uh, there's a, apparently Jamie's Internet disconnected when John toppled over. So she may, may or may not be back. Um, she just sent me a message to let me know. Um, but so there's always this interactive component. So students are encouraged to attend and ask questions, answer questions. I, I don't know if we've had it in the last year or two, but we had a, a part-time faculty member in, pol in poli sci who just had an open forum where students could come in and say, I want to talk about blank. Um, and you get some very lively discussions uh, in that in that programming. Um, but Democracy Days is just one of the many sort of experiential things and co-curricular activities that we have. Um, the English department puts on an open mic night twice a semester called uh, Coffee House, where any student, faculty, staff member, community member can come and read 
uh, their creative work. We have a literary magazine that publishes work by students, by faculty members, by staff members, by community members. Um, and so we've really prided ourselves on maintaining those things that are parts of being a community, the community part of the community college that, that sort of extends the branch from the sort of employee groups of faculty, staff, administration to the students and then to the wider world that's a part of the community. Because really, we open our doors to anyone who wants to be a participant in many of those, those activities. Um, Tell yeah, that's, that's literary that. journal in your public. Oh, yeah, yeah. So for, 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 yes, yeah, so sure. For the, some of the service learning component in the creative writing program, we just actually, as part of my sabbatical project a few years ago, uh, I created a, two things. I, we created a, a certificate of, another certificate of specialization, this one in literary editing and publishing. Um, and along with that, I, I revamped two courses. Um, we have a course that I teach in the fall, very creatively called Creative Writing 2, um, where students, part of that class is that students serve on the editorial board for a literary magazine. So my students are doing this right now. So we, they read submissions from real people from around the world and help decide what pieces of writing we publish. And then in the spring, I offer a class more directly, clearly titled uh, Publishing Workshop, where part of my sabbatical was I started a small press and students help select manuscripts to get published by that press. So in that experiential vein, so they're actually, you know, these are students that want to be writers. And then, and this kind of gives them the sort of um, a foray into the literary publishing world in a very real way. You know, we talked to, I talked to them about, you are reading, at, at, this isn't just samples. These are actual writers whose work we are either accepting or rejecting over the course of the semester. Um, and, you know, and then I, you know, a big part of the ex notion of experiential learning is like reflecting on what you've learned, right? And so they, they write up and we, we talk about and they write about what they are learning about being a writer by virtue of doing these things. And I think they like it. They eventually, for the literary magazine, they get a copy of the magazine and in the front cover, it's got their name listed as an editing editing assistant. And so they get all they get all excited about that. Uh, but and and we have folded that into so they get service learning credit for that course. Um, and so just another example of the the different ways that the service learning program uh, looks uh, on our campus. Well, That's all I say about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I just I just want to say wow, um, you know, what, what you have what you have going on at SCC is something that I think I think every community college in the nation could hope to have. Um, I know that you have uh, issues with, with 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 administration there, but the, but but the funding the funding that you're getting is is stunning. You you obviously have to have at least. At least some support for it. We've had we've had administrators tell our faculty that they can't have the, the Carter Symposium anymore. You know, among other things, uh, you know, it, that that, it, that they're not allowed to declare their their affiliation to the community college. So you know, I mean, just to, to to begin to give you some kind of some kind of outside perspective on the, the wonderful things that you have going on in in, in your English department and at the at the college. I hope that I that I'm able to give you that, and and yet again say, you know, please write write this so that other people can have it. I know I'm going to uh, put the video up and 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 make a link for it, and, um, Thank you know, you. be a behind the scenes kind of thing. Um, but uh, uh, I, I I can't I can't wait to have share this with with my colleagues, and hopefully hopefully they'll watch and and pay attention to what's going on. Um, you know and. Uh, uh, and and I think uh, uh, I'll I'll show it to Darren Jensen, who is the who's the editor at CDTYC, so that he'll be he'll be familiar with your name uh, by the time anybody gets there. Thank you, thank you. Work so will get much. out eventually. <laughs> I, I I I hope so. You know, I I, I hope I hope it does. Um, uh, you, you you know, I I wish you know I I'm 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 hoping that that. that what happens over time here? I mean, we have we're we're, we're losing students. We're, you know, uh, there are other other universities that they're paying a lot more money to to to, to, to attend rather than coming here and getting what, what can be a very high quality education. Um, you know, there there are there are some there are some amazing teachers here who are really definitely student devoted uh, um, um, pedagogues, uh, but it's. Um, 
you know, it's it's difficult to to get the word out when you keep getting canceled. Uh, you know, and that's not the positive kind of canceling. Um, I'm amazed that in in conservative Missouri that you're able to to get all of these things happening. I uh, I I think that that's absolutely phenomenal. Um, and you know, keep the, keep that fire burning. Please. Uh, I will say sometimes we do. Really loud. <laughs> yes, we are very loud. We have a reputation uh, of being the department that pushes back when necessary. And but sometimes you sometimes it's been a matter of of doing things in spite of the hurdles that certain parties have created, as opposed to with the blessing thereof. Now, certainly when we do these things, we get praised to high heaven. But then when we ask for the resources to make the doing of them easier there's no money for that. Um, and so there's certainly been challenges. And, you know, I, I think it speaks to the uh, not just integrity, but the, the innovation and desire of the, of the English faculty that, that we've made these things happen. I think oftentimes in spite of the circumstances that we make them in, as opposed to thanks to uh, their, th those things. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think I think we're all really proud of what we do. I don't think we do it for the pride of it. I think we do it because we think they're all valuable things to do. Um, but yeah, there is it's it's not often it is not often because of the support we get. But uh, well, anyway, that's all I have to say about that. Sure, so sure, well, well, so faculty too. right. Well, yeah. yeah I, again, yeah. I think it. I think a lot of it goes back to the hires that our department has done over the last decade have been a big part of it. Um, finding people who want to do these things um, because you know I don't I don't know what the the atmosphere is in at your institution, but it it would be really easy and understandable for people in our department and across our campus to say I'm going to come in and teach my classes and go home. And that's all I'm going to do. Um, you know, there are people that do that. And I don't really fault them for it because there's not a whole lot of external motivation to do more than that. And so it all really has to come from within. Um, and fortunately, we are, I am surrounded by people who are motivated to do those things. Hi, John. Um, <laughs> so, so we're very, you know, we're, we are individually lucky to have the people around us that we do. I don't know what I would say about the people above us. <laughs> so that, that's, I, that's all I'll say about that. <laughs> and we have great students too. I mean, so many of our students, I think that counter to most community colleges, our students tend to come in. I think the average age is what, 19 as opposed to mid twenties, which I think is the case with most more, more community colleges than not. Um, and so we have a lot of students who are fresh out of high school who are really excited and, you know, they, they feel like, they have a chance to say something and they have a stake in it and that they can make a contribution and that their instructors are open to their talents and what they want to give to. And, you know, I think I can speak on behalf of many of our colleagues in our department and in other departments on campus that, again, we're open to change. We're open to, um, you know, coordinating and developing our programming along with the students in our classroom because um, you know, it's what we're there for. I mean, part of it is just the intellectual and academic pursuit of, you know, all of these things that we're obviously passionate about, but we're also there to serve students and to help, you know, prepare that cohort for, you know, going out into the world and hoping, hopefully making a good difference. So, you know, we have that also kind of at the forefront. Um, what we're, what legacy are we trying to impart to? those people in our community. Well, thank you, Jamie and, and Joe and Bryony. Thank you for having this, us. This time, I, I'm it's looking nice. forward to making a pilgrimage unto your Mecca and uh, <laughs> getting down We'd there. We'd love to have you. Apparently, we'll feed you, too. So. Oh, yeah, we'll feed you. <laughs> if you like our snacks, <laughs> we will feed you. <laughs> I'll bring, maybe I'll bring some Halloween treats here. Very good. Um, <laughs> what we need, right? <laughs> and I'm on a diet. Maybe that's what I'm thinking about lately. Um, so, uh, so, 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 thank you so much. Uh, thank I you. look forward. I look. I look forward to more conversations. Uh, as soon as I get this up and running, I'll, I'll let you see. It is a pleasure to have met John. I believe. 
I'm sorry. Many uh, that's a, many people in our department have very small children right now, <laughs> which means what they're all doing even more impressive. I just have three cats, so they're they're not an issue. Cats. I'm surprised they haven't been running around because they go crazy <laughs> when the Zoom is happening, but they're all asleep somewhere. So we've managed. Lucky to get you. Uh, yeah, I don't know how that happened. Anyway, <laughs> I, I think it's wonderful. I think I I I, 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 I when I was younger, uh, participating with my dad who was an <laughs> I just found a picture. I was six years old, and I was uh, I was in kindergarten. I was just about in kindergarten. I was in the archaeological expedition. So, you know, I think I think having having our kids around our academic stuff. Mm -hmm. so yep. Look at me and how well I turned out. Right. Um, anyway, again, thank you so Dylan much. Dylan has fascinating stories from his childhood. <laughs> thank you. Thank you all so much. Yeah. For, for Thanks for having us. I thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, I look forward to speaking to you later. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank All right. You. Very good. Here. Bye, everyone. Bye.